Welcome to another episode of Women Peppreneurs Podcast with your host, Mary Oquendo. So my guest today is Jessica Uzetta. Hi, Jessica. Hello. Uh, so thank you for coming, taking time out of your day to be here. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. So I always like to start off the podcast with how did you get involved in the pet industry? <laughs> um, let's see. That's a loaded question. So I started doing animal rescue when I was 10 years old. Um, and I worked with a rescue group pretty much every summer and every other weekend. And then a sort of, uh, I think I started volunteering and there was a lady that was a groomer. And so we, she started showing me stuff on how to take care of the dogs. And, um, I, you know, I worked for, um, corporates, you know, for a long time. And I actually started, actually, I started my pet career, um, in the vet field when I was 15, that was my first job at a animal hospital. Um, I'm actually still a vet, vet tech. Um, so I've, I've always stuck with that, but that's pretty much where I started with animals. And then I realized that, you know, I'm very artistic. Um, and so grooming sort of was something really fun for me and transition, you know, transforming dog hair was, was really cool and fun. So you know, and I'm maybe I'm not surprised by the number of groomers that started out in rescue at some point in rescue. And many of them, yeah, like I was six years old. I was finding stray dogs and cats and I was just bringing them home, hiding them from my parents and grooming them and trying to find them homes. And yeah. it's a fairly consistent theme. <laughs> it's not like one or two. It's I think over the couple of years that I've been doing this podcast, I've probably interviewed six, seven, eight people who started off with rescue as children. Yeah. Yeah. I always had a huge passion for animals, probably from my dad. We always had lots of animals. Like I did agility when I was young. Like I made agility course in my backyard for, we had an Australian shepherd mix and um, who's very athletic. And yeah, we, you know, that's pretty much where it all started for me anyway. Um, and then, you know, as I got older and things and my mom, my mom was a saint. I would bring home animals and be like, oh, he needs a home or let's find him a home. Or, you know, we, you, we lived sort of in the country. And so it wasn't really always the best thing to bring home an animal, but my mom was very understanding. So. So let me tell you how I turned my mom into a crazy cat lady. <laughs> Okay. So, um, I found the kitten. All right. And I was having the kitten basically live in my room. Okay. Which, you know, can only go so long without an adult in the house and noticing that. Right. Okay. So my mom found it and I'm like, mom, you ruined my surprise. Whatever holiday birthday was coming up. I think it was her birthday. I was like, happy birthday, mom. I was going to surprise you. Okay. But I can. <laughs> um, and that was my mother's first of many cats afterwards. That's funny. My mom actually um, just, they had, so we go to a lot of the grooming com like conferences and stuff. And I always bring dogs for those. And two of my mom's dogs have always gone as demo dogs because like they have to get groomed anyway and you might as well come and they're a little bit obnoxious and they are really great for good like new groomers because one of them was like a cavalier mix and the other one is a cockapoo and they're both a little you know drama so um she unfortunately the one dog just you know we had we had to put him to sleep because he was like 15 and he had you know all the old man things she's like we're not getting another dog we're not getting another dog and I'm like, oh, okay, okay, whatever you say. And my stepdad really has always wanted um, a border collie or an Australian shepherd. And I just happened to, um, since I still do rescue, I just happened to have one that I actually got back from um, a previous adoption and great dog, um, typical border collie, like to the T, like textbook border collie. And I have a house full of poodles, so it wasn't really driving very well. And I kept telling them, well, my mom was like, we're not taking the dog. We're not taking the dog. We're not taking the dog. Well, long story short, I said, why don't you just try her for the weekend? Why don't you just watch her for me for the weekend and see how she does at your house? Because I knew she'd fit in really well there. And their other dog was lonely, you know, because he's always had another dog. So they have a border collie now. <laughs> <laughs> and 
they she called me a couple weeks ago and she's like i just wanted you to know that we just love her so much and she's just the best dog in the whole wide world i'm like i know i told you she was she's like well i you know i just did, really didn't want another dog i'm like i know but you needed another dog so you know where there's a void i can fill it for just about anybody so yeah. I currently, I currently have four dogs and um, oh. I'm not looking to add more dogs to my life. Okay. <laughs> and I say that now as I have four dogs, um, two of which are full blown out seniors and one is middle aged and the other one is pretty close to middle age. Okay. Yeah. I say that now, and here's the thing. I still want to be involved with rescue, but I actually don't want to work at a rescue. Right. Yeah. Okay? Because that is, and I would never let my husband volunteer at a rescue because <laughs> it's, there's other ways you can help the rescue by you just like not being there because him yes. being there yes. empty out the shelter, we'd have, right. we'd have way too many dogs. Let's just put it that yes. way. Yes, I, I totally understand that. So I, I have write... a go ahead. Go ahead. I have I have a, a limit and I'm at it. So my kids are like, oh, can we keep this one? And I'm like, nope. So we still foster, but I'm like, no, we can't keep any more dogs. We're at our limit. So especially for dogs that are not from the poodle world. So you know, so I write the pet lover report for the local radio station instead. So oh, I feel cute. like I'm doing something, right? but not in actually in direct contact. Right. And because when I write the reports and I'm looking at the pictures of the dogs on the website, I'm like, oh, so <laughs> yes. Oh. oh, yeah, but no, they're cute. They're cute. Oh, he's someone a, else's house. <laughs> he needs a place. So I'm like, no, oh, yeah, no. You'll That's help the danger. Me, but you cannot come to my house anymore. Right. Um, but anyway, so you're in the competition world, correct? Uh, yeah. So when I started grooming, um, I actually worked for a lady that um, showed toy poodles of all things. And um, I worked for a big box store and I was wanting to just learn more. And, you know, um, it's a good place to start but I was wanting to be better and learn more. And, you know, growing up in rescue, unfortunately, the negatives and the positives, you know, they always told me that people that breed dogs are terrible and breeder, you know, I was filled with all these um, incorrect information about dog breeders and, and responsible people. Um, and so when I got into grooming, um, you know, I sort of started seeing all of the bad breeding and then I would every once in a while you'd see a really nicely bred dog and you're like oh wow um so I, I got I started competing like really on a really just like breakthrough you know where I went to a couple local shows um and I had clients dogs or my dog that were not well bred um you know and it was interesting um but I learned a lot and I, it was like addictive and then um, you know, I got in touch with certain people. It's actually how I started, um, how I got into poodles was through grooming competitions. Um, my first competition dog that was a client's dog, he was a one-eyed puppy mill standard poodle. Um, and he was my first competition dog. And um, then I fell in love with poodles and I never, like, I'd never been around poodles except for grooming. And I had stayed, he like stayed with me for the weekend. I'm like, oh my gosh. This thing is so cute and he doesn't smell and he doesn't shed and he's so soft. He's like a living stuffed animal. Um, and that's what made me fall in love with poodles. And so then I started competing and, you know, I still compete. Um, it's a, a little different now because I'm got so many things going, but I love competing and I love, you know, teaching and, you know, showing other people all the cool things that I've learned. And it's super fun to share all the knowledge that you get, you know, from doing something like that. Yeah, I gave a little bit of thought to competing because I also started off in the box stores. And I had really good mentors at the box stores, by the way. Yeah. And I had two Bichons that I were well-bred Bichons, okay? And both people wanted them in like a show trim and I had them. I, I could have at least went into entry with them. But then I went mobile and mobile was way out of their price range. So that kind of squished that one. Right. But, 
probably one of my few regrets in life is not getting myself on a stage and doing and, and at least at least an entry you know right yeah. i've always admired people who do competitions because you know what i especially admire people who go into entry yes all right because there's you're going in with no you're going in i'm not saying blind but you're <laughs> going in and you don't have a reputation or anything of that and it just it i think that's that's, I think that's amazing and very brave. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a lot easier now too than when I started because I, I mean, it's terrifying at first, but it's just like so rewarding and you get like such a personal, like I, this is why I tell everybody that wants to, that thinks about competing. I'm like, don't think of it as like a contest. Like you, it's really like when you start out, it's like a Brit, you know, building blocks and a bridge to like learning to be a better groomer and just to see things differently. Like when they, when they point things out and then learning the structure of a dog or a breed, like what it's supposed to be. And then what you have and like corrective grooming. Cause a lot of like an entry, you know, a lot of them start out with like needing a lot of corrective grooming that teaches you more than anything. And it, then when you get a dog, that's really nice and, and is structurally put together, right? Like it, you're like a better groomer. You're like, oh my God, this looks so good. And you're almost like proud of yourself because you've accomplished something and, you know, you really can do something with that. Okay. Um, so what's the next show you're going to be at? Um, I show probably. Um, so I put on a grooming show in St. Louis. Um, it's in April. Um, so that's our next show that we're going to be doing. Is that the Groom and Fest? Yes, it's Groom Fest. It's at the end of April. And it's, um, we're groom team sanctioned this year, which is super exciting. So we have, um, a bunch of classes. I think there's six or eight, there's eight different competitions. And then we have a bunch of classes and it's just so much information and so much fun, awesome education and learning. And, um, the, the grooming competitions are going to be fierce this year. We have like a record, record breaking entry so far. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. For us, for us, which is a lot. So okay. we have about double already that registered than what we had last year. So that's nice. super. Yeah. So good. Congratulations. Um, I will tell yeah. you what is not on my bucket list. Um, and that is to put together an in-person trade show. Yes, it's a lot. <laughs> oh, my God. No, I it's. I tell people, you couldn't give me the show. You couldn't say, hey, Mayor, you know, I've been doing this for a couple of years and I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. So I'll give you the show. And I'd be like, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm, a, you know, I'm a high functioning um, ADHD. So it actually, you know, chaos, I, I like chaos. It sort of makes me feel at home. Um, so doing all the stuff is fun for me and providing and offering classes. And I've always, like I've been teaching for a long time anyway, um, but being able to bring a bunch of people together, especially like all my favorite people is really cool because then they can share all the knowledge and, you know, people can learn. And, um, you know, there's just so many new groomers that are so hungry for like learning stuff that it's, it's really great. So that's the whole reason I do it. Like when we started it, it was really small. Like we probably had, I don't know, 40 or 50 people that came, um, and then last year, I think our show, we had like six, over 600 attendees, um, plus all the contest competitors. So it's grown. And then this year is going to be, it's going to be a little probably overwhelming, but it's going to be good. So we have so many, a really great group of people. What year is this for you for the show? Um, so that's a, <laughs> that's sort of an odd question or an odd answer. So we started, I think it was in 2010 or 2011. I was looking back. Um, 2010, I think. And, but I took a couple, like a couple years break because I had a baby and, you know, had, you know, divorce and stuff like that. And then Groom South had moved to St. Louis for a couple of years. So we sort of had like a three year break, um, but we've, I've been doing it since 2010. Okay. So this and is what, our, what's, the web, what's, what's your website? Uh, STLgroomfest.com is the website. Okay. And our, our classes, most of the classes are, we're, I'm actually finishing that up this weekend. Um, cause I was, I had the flu for the last week and a half. So I was in bed along with half of 
our area, everyone got wiped out by the flu. So, um, but we have so much stuff that we're offering and it's a great, you know, great thing for people to come and it's for groomers by groomers. Like, you know, we're all very much like family familiar with each other and, you know, where everyone's very open and everyone's, you know, really about helping each other out, like whether it's business or learning a skill or, you know, skin coat or, you know, what have you. There's so many different um, topics that we have to share with everybody. So I'm excited. Good. I wish you, I wish you success, which will bring us to our first sponsor, by the way. Okay. Which is where I will be in July. I will be at the Rocky Mountain Groom Expo in Colorado Springs. So I'm teaching um, a six hour mobile grooming class there. And this is Tina's second year that she's doing this show. Um, but this is a couple of things about the show that I really like. Okay. First of all, they're doing a mock competition class. So for somebody who doesn't, who's never been in a competition, who wants to get a feel for what it is, it's basically going to teach you how to like do your first grooming competition. And then you have to bring a dog to, to, and I'll put in, in quotation marks to compete and have judges go over the dogs. I thought that was a little unique um, and a great class for, for people who are thinking about competing. But I'm going to tell you the other thing that has me excited about the show. Maybe, maybe it's something you could do for your show because it's not being held at a hotel. Right. And there's not like restaurants and stuff in the area. She has food trucks coming in. Okay. The truck that I am most excited about is a truck, food truck that makes crepes. Ooh. Yeah. Seriously. I'm going to tell everybody, you see me walking towards that crepe truck, (laughs) just move aside. (laughs) That's real. Yeah. That sounds cool. So. Um, their tickets are not up for sale yet. They go on sale April 1st and their website is RockyMountainGroomExpo.com. So that's one of the shows we're looking at hitting up this year to go to. So, yeah, you know mm-hmm. what? I couldn't go last year because it, the date interfered with something else I was already obligated to do, but I heard really good things about the show. So I wanted to make sure I've never been to Colorado, by the way. So me either. it's supposed to be beautiful there. It's supposed to be beautiful. I'm not, I think, I, I think I'm coming in like a day early. So, cause I do like to, I have never been someplace and this is one of the nice things about trade shows. All right. Go to a trade show, take an extra day. Okay. And do or two, <laughs> or, two or three yeah. <laughs> and do something fun. I'm doing the fun in the sun this year, which I've never done before, but I'm going to piggyback it along with with a vacation with for me and my husband down in the Orlando area. I think we're going to do the same thing. We're thinking about that too. So we haven't been, to, I haven't been to Florida in a long time. And you know what? And sometimes it's really nice to go to Disney and whatever without dragging kids along. <laughs> well, I'll have my kids with me, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, my kids are grown. I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> The best vacation I ever took, okay? This was right after 9-11. People were freaking out about flying to no yeah. on vacation. And I had never been on a plane before. So my first plane ride was right after 9-11. And I'm oh, like, wow. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> day I, was not, I was a little nervous about that flight. But me and my husband went to California for Disney out in California and the park was empty. Oh, wow. There was like, I don't know, six kids in that entire park. Wow. There was no line, no wait on any of the lines. We had to like stagger it a little bit because, you know, you can't do roller coasters back after back after back. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have physical back pain and you're going to throw up. Yeah. <laughs> so there's... Good. There's a little bit of, 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 of you know, why you want to wait to go on to the next ride. Anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, but we literally had, you know, we stayed at Disney and we had Chip and Dale for breakfast every morning. They just like That's sat cute. down at our table because there was nobody That's, else to sit down with, you know? That's funny. So that was, that was a pretty awesome 
vacation and it was we went to a kids theme park and there were no kids there. Yeah, right. Yeah. You got a personalized vacation. Basically. That's basically. cool. So, okay. So um the reason that I had asked you on here, all right. So I had put a post up on my my profile about, you know, and you you put you said you wanted to do it, and then I of course stalked your profile. And the first thing I noticed was your banner picture with all your plants. And I'm like, yeah, I'm asking Jessica (laughs) because I'm having a greenhouse build. And I've been like really open. So if you've been listening to my podcast, if you've been watching my phone, you know, I got, you know, I have a greenhouse being built. In fact, right now, as we are are recording this, their crew is out there putting it together. I know I'm jealous. Which brings me to one point is, could me and my husband have done this ourselves? Maybe. But you Probably. know what? Maybe. No, I'll say maybe. <laughs> okay. okay. But isn't it just so much better to hire people who know what they're doing? Yes, it is. Okay. So rather than taking three months to build it, <clears throat> they'll have it's a big one. So they'll have it done in a couple of days. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I saw your post about it. It's exciting. It's very exciting. I've got seeds starting in the house already. And oh, wow. Yeah, I know. So I've got seedlings and I don't know what I am more excited about. The fact that, oh my God, seeds have sprouted. I have baby plants. So yeah, that's exciting. I've only done that a couple of times um, with like growing like vegetables and stuff. Most of mine are like tropical plants and other house plants, I guess. Well, it's, a, it's a large, it's go, it's large. It's 13 by 26. So it's big. So oh, it's wow. good. Um, greenhouse slash she, she shed for lack of better she word. Shed, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it'll be, I have a meditation area in there. I may even hold classes in there too. Local that's cool. Class. Yeah. That would be really cool. But like a little koi pond or something in there. I think that's probably where I'm not going to do. I don't no. think I'm going to put a koi pond in there. I mean, I say that now, okay? Ask me again in a couple of years. And I'm like, oh, yeah, the koi pond's over there now. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, it's easy to, uh, it helps with the humidity. Yeah, that's what I heard. Fish, you know, you don't have to do like koi. You could just do like the 10 cent goldfish or whatever. But they also, you can put live plants and it sort of is like a little mini ecosystem. It's pretty cool. Well, that I might do, okay? I'm definitely going to have running water in there. I mean, water fountains. So I may start off with, you know, water fountains in there. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know, you know, it's, I'm thinking too far ahead right now. My plan is to grow a hundred dollar tomatoes. Okay. Those are cool. Yeah. You know, it's, I'll, I'll see whether or not this actually will ever see the investment as far as food production is concerned. Um, I'm thinking that's going to be kind of hard pressed because there's only two of us here. So how much fruits and vegetables will I be growing? I'm not sure, but there'll be a lot of plants in there. It's going to be a nice place to be. Yeah. I may may even, um, start up energetic work again, which I have not done professionally in, oh, probably eight years, nine years, maybe 10 years. So I may, I may get back to that. I don't know. Right now it's being built and, and I got to get plants in there. Yeah. It's, it's a lot, it's, it's easier. It'll, it'll all happen once, once it's done, you'll start putting stuff in there and st- everything will start growing pretty quickly. It gr- everything grows pretty quickly as long as you, you know, nurture it and they make fun of me at the salon. So I have a lot of plants at my house and I have even more plants at my salon and I have baby plants that I've propagated. And then we have an aquarium, um, a pretty large aquarium and I propagate most things in my aquarium um, and then transition it to soil. And so I have all these like plants and I go around and I shake them all, make them feel like they're in the wild and you got to give them a little bit of, you know, physical abuse so that they feel like they're, you know, getting what they get in the wild and um it's pretty funny and then I missed them all with my bottle and then you know I turn them all every so often so they all get different you know amounts of sun on the leaves and 
it's pretty funny. So, but they are my, happy. So, yeah, that's pretty much going to be my plan in a couple of weeks. Um, I went to my first ever um, garden show. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I will do different at my next garden show is to bring a cart. Yes. And make sure when you get home to wash your plants. I know that sounds really weird, but there's, um, they sell these really cool little, they're like, um, beads almost. And they kill, they, they kill parasites in the plants. And then you can spray them with like a little diluted, um, like Dawn dish soap and water, um, or like vinegar and a little bit of soap and water. And you like wipe, especially if it's like a bigger leaves, um, cause there's always, there's always hitchhikers on plants, especially like from stores or garden centers or really anywhere that the plants kind of come together. It's, they're sort of like fleas, but not quite as annoying on the plants. So right, I have some, I have some questions for you. Okay. Yeah. And this is, the, again, this is why like, oh yeah, I've got to pick her brain. We'll, we'll do it while we'll do it on a podcast. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, some of the things that I have heard, so you can go true or false, or, or it doesn't make a difference. Okay. I could buy ladybugs and I can put them in my greenhouse and that'll help with the bug population. That does help. Yes. Okay. So um, ladybugs are now on my shopping list. <laughs> Writing that down. You have to replenish them though, because they, they don't have a super long lifespan, but yeah. Yeah. And, all the, and they could also fly out and like whatever. Mm -hmm. So I will now off the top of your head, do you have a good source for ladybugs? I don't because I don't have, so like I have my, a lot of my plants in the salon and pe people would be very upset if a ladybug went flying by and they would probably freak out. So uh, I've always yeah. wanted to do the ladybugs, but like I have a cat also that eats everything. So I have a hairless cat and he's naughty and I've just got him, I've just got him stopped from eating and chewing on the leaves of my plants. So I think, yeah, but no, ladybugs, I know a few people that do that and it does work really well. All right. So I'm going to give that a whirl. I had, I was, as mobile, I would go in people's houses and I had one client like literally like drag me in her house one day. She goes, look, look, I don't know what to do about them. Are they dangerous? And on her windowsill, because it was transitioning from fall into winter, was, mm -hmm. was like dozens of ladybugs. Were they the... Uh, um the um the other the orange ones yeah so those orange. ones are bad the asian what are they called no no um, they, the, they had the i guess the standard red ones red oh they were the red ones the red ones yes yeah when the midwest we get these they're like they're like um ladybug imposters and they're oh, like no, they're like more of an orangey color and they like sting you or bite you Ooh. but they look just like a ladybug and then there's sometimes like thousands of them on the windows but yeah, no. no, no these, ladybugs these are, are awesome. Yeah, so no, I said there's ladybugs. I, there's like um, old wives' tales that say, you know what, having ladybugs in your house is a good thing. Yeah, I think it's good luck or something. Something, something along those lines. Yeah. So, but then she also had two crazy cats. I'm not sure how long those ladybugs last. <laughs> yeah, they were kitty treats, kitty crunchies. Yeah, yeah, kitty crunchies. Um. So what kind of plants do you have? Oh, I have a lot of plants. I have some succulents and then I have a lot of um, pothos. So there's a huge family. Pothos family is huge. I have a lot of monstera's um, and like golden pothos and Brazilian pothos, which is our, those are my favorite and they're really easy to propagate. Um, and I like the the string of things. So they have, um, where they all, they kind of grow down and dangle. We have a string of turtles is what they're called. And they're shell, they're so tiny and they look like little turtle shells. And they sometimes will, you know, little leaves fall off and you just kind of place them in dirt and then they root and then they just keep growing. And, um, but my, I have a lot of monsteras um, because I have a problem with monsteras. I will Absolutely. propagate and I will chop something and then grow it and then put it in soil and then it gets all big and pretty and then I cut more off and make more plants and try to give them away so all right so I have this huge aloe vera which needs to oh, be yeah. put into a bigger pot okay yes but but as soon as that ground that the, my greenhouse as I may have mentioned 
a couple of times already, is done, I'm getting a bigger pot and putting the whole thing into the bigger pot. And I think that's going to be like a center point for like the meditation area of it because gotcha. I put in a pot that's probably about four times the size that it's in now. Right now it's a little- Don't go too big. It doesn't like it when you go too big. So just be careful with that. Ah. If you go up too much, then then it kind of gets- um it gets kind of angry. So you, the rule of thumb is you only want to go up like one pot size at a time. And it's based on like your root ball of your plant and aloe vera. They, um, like if it's a mother plant and does it have little babies? Does it have little babies? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Sometimes you can take all those little babies out and give it more room and like, but yeah, you don't want to go too, too big right away. Cause sometimes it'll shock your plant and then you'll be super sad. I did that one time and it took like Oh, probably eight months for it to recover. And it, and then it, it finally did, but it took a really long time because I was like right, so eager to make it more space. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't buy the pot yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you'll I'll have to look and see how big your root ball is. I'll just get a slightly bigger pot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. All right. And so um, you were talking about the Montsero. Oh, yeah. There's, um, I got, there's a bunch of different ones. I have the, the variegated ones. I have regular ones. I have the, some of them have the big Swiss cheese, you know, leave holes in them for the light. Um, and they love all plants do really well, as long as you don't overwater them. That's the one thing that people do. You know, sometimes you have plants that just don't thrive or they have some weird, you know, fungus or bug especially if they come from like the big box stores like oh, and home and home stuff. From the big box stores right and I'm... then you bring stuff home and sometimes i will get a plant that looks like it's dying and then i bring it home and make it not you know not dead and then it's you know but usually um well, like depending on... you're muted as long as you don't overwater them they do really well all right, so um, we've got a couple of really good nurseries in the area. And I found out that I can plant like dwarf fruit trees. Oh, yeah. So that has me fairly excited. But I could also grow a banana plant, which I did not know I could do that. Oh, yeah, those are super easy. We can grow those here, too. People will just, um, as long as the, like, you can keep the ground from freezing all the way. Like, people will throw compost and, like, um mulch over the top of them they like cut them down at the end of the season and they they do really well almost everywhere and they all they love greenhouses they will grow and grow and grow and grow all right that's good to know so i think probably what i'm planning on doing there again is like the whole meditation area but you know some fruits and veg you know i would like to get a lot of fruit trees i'm gonna get like a dwarf orange tree um some dwarf lemons and I'm not sure, maybe some fruit bushes like strawberries and blueberries. Oh, yeah, that's cool. You can even hang those like um, from the top, like the strawberries. Yeah. All the, most of the berries you can hang up top and have like different levels of, of plants and stuff. So we'll see. I, I will post pictures. As, oh, yeah, for as sure. Long, I will be posting pictures of, because this is like a huge project that I'm very... I'm, I don't know if you noticed this, but I'm very excited about it. Yes. I, <laughs> yeah, I've seen you post about your greenhouse. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And everybody so, needs plants in their salon. Everyone should have a plant or two in their salon. I very had a plant in my mobile grooming van. You know, just, you know, what? when I was driving, the plant would go into the tub. So, you mm -hmm. know, and, but, you know, when I was parked, I would put it on the window, you know, on the driver's seat so yeah. that it was sunlight. You know, and in nice humid environment. I always had a plant in my mobile grooming van. I, I can't yep. imagine not having a plant wherever it is that you're working. Yeah, plants make a huge difference. They clean we have one in our tub at the salon too. Like in our it's there's no light window in that room, but there's light and we have a big pothos in the corner um above one of our tubs and it just keeps growing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, which will bring us up to our second, um, our second sponsor. So, Jessica, are yes. you are you ambitious and motivated? I am. Are you looking to make a change in the direction in the pet industry? 
Yes, I am. <laughs> Are you afraid to take that first step? But not really. Okay. But some people but are. are you okay? Well, let's just assume you are. Are you <laughs> okay. what the first step even is? No. What is it? What should it be? Okay, well then your first step should be join the Create That Program monthly membership. There's already 17 hours and counting of pre-recorded materials, workbooks, and checklists. Right. There's a monthly group coaching call, which actually is on Monday. Well, this Monday. From the time this airs, like, I don't know, a couple of Mondays before that, uh, with me, and it's $197 a month, and you can begin creating your legacy in the pet industry. So join createthatprogram.com at createthatprogram.com. Cool. Okay, moving it along. All right, so where do you see yourself? Where would you like to be in the pet industry? Let's say five-ish um, from now. Um, I don't really, I, you know, I was thinking about that the other day. I don't really have a really good answer for that. Cause I did not expect to see myself where I'm at right now. Um, this soon ish. So on top of like competing and doing the poodles and like I show my dogs and I also own two grooming salons. Um, and I have, you know, a bunch of really great employees you know, and we're getting ready to, to go back and we're going to start doing actually mobile um, on top of our salons. Um, you know, I'm I'm really content with how well everything is going. And, you know, it would be nice for me to be able to, you know, just be able to still help and like teach and mentor people. I like like part of the reason we started the grooming show is I like mentoring people. I like teaching people things. I like sharing inform. I love sharing information. So like, I don't like gatekeeping things. Like when someone tells me something really cool, the first thing I usually do is call like, I have like five or six people on my list of friends and I'm like, Oh my God, this super cool thing I learned. You're never going to believe how cool this is. And I love to just share, you know, stuff with people. So being able to do that and, you know, I like to travel I really would like to travel more um, and go to more shows. There's so many more shows. Actually, I was just having a conversation um, with my friend Nick about how many great shows there are now, like all the Barkley shows. And then you have like all the other shows that are popping up, all the independent, like privately owned yeah. grooming shows and stuff. Like I want to go to more of those because it is so fun and getting out and, you know, experiencing things and being able to, to travel more is probably my biggest where I want to be at and you know maybe have another grooming show I think I'm teetering on a little bit crazy level there but um you know that would be exciting to there's some areas that don't have anything still there's um, so many areas that so. don't have anything have you thought about having for lack of a better word a union for the, the small independent trade show directors um yes and no I'm you know I'm not Believe it or not, I'm not the best, most organized person, um, partially because I have ADHD. But like, um, you know, sometimes getting groomers to do things that they don't really want to do is like it's like hurting cats, you know. And so it doesn't always that doesn't always seem fun. It does sound like a really good idea, though, in getting people sort of together and on board. And, um, you know, I think yeah, part no, just, of all just, the different just... shows. Just the individual trade, there's a handful of you guys. There's yeah. Oh, there's Tina Davis. Mm -hmm. There's you. There's Nick. There's yep. um Ralph Whitman. Quincy. Um Quincy Cole. She just, yep. The Teton show. Yep. Um, and then yeah, there's 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 so many people. There's um, but I know I think it would be good, like a like almost like a group like a grooming trade show round table or something if people could even get together or get yeah. on the same you know phone Shoot line or something back, back and forth you know yeah. this is this is working for me this is not working for me maybe it works for you i don't know but yeah. maybe having some sort of you know people you could bounce ideas off of um because it only makes you better yeah well and the groomers that put them together i think we have a little like our approach is way different um just because like I never intended, obviously, like, it's great when things are, are profitable and doing well, but, like, that was never, like, the intent for our show 
was never like a it was never like um this is gonna be a business kind of thing and I'm gonna make lots of money doing it it's always been like we put so much more we've <laughs> We put so much money into like our prizes and we really want people to come like um I really want as many groomers to come and learn stuff so that they can go and share it you know and so I think sharing with other you know grooming uh conference or other you know producers is would, would be cool too um we do get together sometimes though too like I talk to a lot of the other ones um on Facebook and we sort of throw things back and forth with each other um, every once in a while, you know, I'll talk to Todd at one of the Barkley shows and, you know, everybody, everybody's pretty friendly and we all communicate, you know, so we do a little bit of that probably, but yeah, having an, you know, get together organization would be probably pretty cool for someone else to do. I don't think I could do it. I'm... <laughs> okay. So, you know what, we threw so, yeah. that out into the universe. Yes. So... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's see what happens with that. That's right. All right. So what words of wisdom do you have for your fellow groomers? Um, never stop learning. Um, you know, never stay in one place and feel the people, a lot of groomers in the industry get stuck in a rut or they get stuck in a place or in a situation. Um, and I feel like people feel like they're always, you know, they're always stuck. It feels like, especially newer groomers and even seasoned groomers that have been somewhere, you know, if you're unhappy and you're not fulfilled you know go do something different or go somewhere different um there's so many different experiences and different ways to do things especially when it comes to grooming whether it's like a salon or if you're mobile or you work for like a big box or you know there's always something else and there's always going to be a job for you anywhere you go like I tell people that and they look at me like I'm crazy but like I've never in my entire life with this career like ever been able to like been worried about not having a job or not having money because I, I know I can always like, I've always known that no matter what happens, I will always land on my feet in a grooming salon or in a pile of dog hair, whether it's in a salon or, you know, grooming out of my home or in someone's home, like you're never, you're never um, tied down, I guess, to the table that you're at, if that makes sense. So yeah, it does. Even when before I pulled the plug and decided to retire fully. So when I decided to move out to Washington, I initially thought I would be grooming out here. You know, um, I could botch that idea fairly quickly, but not because I couldn't, this is I had decided that I was going to move in a different direction, but right. I, I still have a full set of tools. I could right. literally walk into any grooming shop here and say, Hey, need some help. Yep. And even if you don't want to groom and you want to, like, I have a lot of people that call me for like consulting, like, because they want to open a salon or they want to revamp something or they want to change something and they just don't know where like to start, um, you know, and so just there's always options. And I think it's in the pet world or pet, you know, careers, there's always something for us to do, even if it's not grooming you know, cause our do our bodies do start to break down after like 20 years. Um, well, that's the know, only downside to it. Just to, just to circle back a little bit. That's the whole point of create that program, by the way, is to do something else in the pet industry besides actually grooming. Yep. There's always something. And I, I get veterinarians that call me, um, you know, because I am well-respected within that community as, as well. And they'll call me and ask me questions and, um, you know, consult or, you know, people will, will ask advice about how to deal with, you know, employees or, you know, pricing or what, whatever aspect of the industry. And so just having, you know, having that experience and knowledge just you know, you can always do something. So. Okay. So Jessica, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And everybody join us for the next episode when I interview someone else making a difference in the pet industry.